Well, welcome everybody to our book discussion. This is the first discussion for our on our book of the month. We'll be doing this every fourth Sunday from seven to eight p.m. and it is a two-part uh, event. The first event will be uh, like we had last week with Joy Kaiser, who wrote the book America's Other Audubon, um, and uh, Drina. Before we get started with this this week's shares, I wondered if you would just uh, share a few words about how you came to know about the book, why you like the book, and uh, what you uh, took away from Joy's conversation about her book. Okay. Well, I was... Uh, delighted when my boy, my son's girlfriend gave me the other Audubon for a Christmas present and so I had an opportunity this was I think two or three years ago and so I had an opportunity then to be looking at it over a period of time and just um, amazed at the story of how the book came to be with the whole family involvement and the skill and knowledge level of this family. And then the other amazing story of Joy Kaiser and how she walked into the Museum of Natural History in Cleveland and saw one page display of it. And then that piqued her curiosity enough that she um, took it on as a, as a project to find out more about how this book had come into being. And it took her, uh, you know, it, it took her into so many other uh, ways of life and places around the country and to London where she had an opportunity to talk about it and find that there was another copy of the book there. I thought that was amazing. Um, so it's been just, it, and then to have Joy actually at the book club last week and to be there and to tell us about, more about the family and the and the whole story and and in such depth. It's really, truly, to me, it was just a wonderful story. Two stories, Joy's story and the book story. I, I would agree uh, with that, Tarina. That's exactly what I thought. Um, Joy grew up in Ohio, is an Ohio native, uh, started her life outside of Barberton, Ohio, and um, she told us a little bit about her life, and then she went into coming to the uh, Natural History Museum and um, <clears throat> their rare books curator and seeing that one page and thinking to herself, wow, shouldn't there be more to this story than one page out of this book with her name, Genevieve Jones, and that just started her on her quest. So it was, it was really, really a very interesting book discussion, and um, she was a, a very good uh, energetic speaker. She really loved the interactivity, and she has told Betsy and me both that she would in, really enjoy coming back and talking to us again about another uh venture she has going or some other things that she has found out about rare books in her her travels and her positions that she's had with uh, the Smithsonian and other places. So, okay, Nancy, are you ready to be our first speaker? I guess I, I am. am. Uh, <laughs> all right. No pressure here. No, no, but this is this is Nancy's first uh, book discussion, as it is all of ours, and she was gracious enough to say that she would be the first one to share her book. And so she has it up there on the uh, screen, A Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, and I'm really interested in Nancy's story as to why this is her favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Gloria. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. Um, it really was not a book that got me interested in nature. I've always been interested in nature. But when I picked up a Sand County Almanac, 
it pulled together so much of how I feel about nature. Because Leopold, oh, uh, first of all, he was he grew up I guess he was born in Iowa, but then was out west and then wound up settling in Wisconsin. Um, the book was published actually a year after he was killed in, a, in an accident. He was putting out a prairie fire or helping a neighbor put out fire um, and um, had a heart attack. Uh, so he really never saw the book published. Um, but his stories are, are they're scientific. They're philosophical. They, he is the father of ecology, how everything interacts and works together. And when I take a walk through the woods or through a field or in a neighborhood, I'm like, gee, I wonder why that's growing there. How are those mushrooms interacting with other things in that person's yard? I mean, I get all of these questions going in my head, and this is the type of thing that that he uh, worked on as well, too, just trying to figure out how things fit. Um, he, he is kind of the, um, a, the land ethic, how everything fits together. Not just the plants and animals, but the soil, the fungi, the, the, the nutrients in the soil, just everything, how everything is just pulled together. And on the slide, there is that... Uh, uh, what Betsy has there is the, the Leopold Foundation, the Aldo Leopold Foundation, and that is based in Wisconsin. Um, and again, there's so many um, organizations that that utilize his his information, and it's still relevant today. So if you read the book, if you get a chance to read it, you'll say, oh my gosh, what he wrote about in 1945 is still relevant today. The land ethic, um, how government feels about or sees the land, how businesses see land use, and you can probably guess it's not usually very good, how agriculture looks at land use as well too. So all of these things together that we're still wrangling with and wrestling with is stuff that he was talking about ages and ages ago. Um, I actually have a favorite, one of my favorite uh, chapters of the book. It's, it's called Odyssey. Um, it's not very long and I'm hoping I can read it while, while everyone is on. And believe it or not, ages ago, um, it, the National Audubon in one of their magazines had the public, the, uh, the story called Odyssey. Okay. And I ripped it out of that Audubon magazine, and you can see it's kind of tattered uh, because I've just kept it. And every once in a while, I will pull it out and just read it because it, it just, and as I start reading it, uh, if I get a little choked up, it's because, again, it's just so relevant. So if, if you don't mind, may I read it to everyone? This will be your bedtime story. I hope not. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see. Go All right. right. Please do. All right. Odyssey. X had marked time in the limestone ledge since the Paleozoic seas covered the land. Time to an atom locked in a rock does not pass. The break came when a burr oak root nosed down a crack and began prying and sucking. In the flash of a century, the rock decayed and X was pulled out and up into the world of living things. He helped build a catkin, which became an acorn, which fattened a deer, which fed an Indian, all in a single year. From his birth in the Indian's bones, X joined again in chase and flight, feast and famine, hope and fear. He felt these things as changes in the little chemical pushes and poles which tugged timelessly at every atom. When the Indian took his leave of the prairie, X moldered briefly underground, only to embark on a second trip through the bloodstream of the land. 
This was the time, th th this time it was a rootlet of blue stem, which sucked him up and lodged him in a leaf, which rode the green billows of the prairie dune, sharing the common task of hoarding sunlight. To this leaf also fell an uncommon task, flicking shadows across a plover's eggs. The ecstatic plover hovered overhead, pouring praises on something perfect. Perhaps the eggs, perhaps the shadows, or perhaps the haze of pink flocks which lay on the prairie. When the departing plovers set wing for the Argentine, all the blue stem waved farewell with tall new tassels. When the first geese came out of the north and all the blue stems glowed wine red, a four-handed deer mouse cut the leaf in which X lay and buried it buried it in an underground nest, as if to hide a bit of Indian summer from the thieving frosts. But a fox detained the mouse. Molds and fungi took the nest apart, and X lay in the soil again, footloose and fancy free. Next, he entered a duft of side oats grandma, a buffalo, a buffalo chip, and again the soil. Next, a spider wart, a rabbit, and an owl, thence a tuft of sporobolus. All routines come to an end. This one ended with a prairie fire, which reduced the prairie plants to smoke, gas, and ashes. Phosphorus and potash atoms lay in the ash, but the nitrogen atoms were gone with the wind. A spectator might, at this point, have predicted an early end of the biotic drama. For with fires exhausting the nitrogen, the soil might well have lost its plants and blown away. But the prairie had two strings in its bow. Fires thinned its grasses, but they thickened its stand of leguminous herbs, prairie clover, bush clover, wild bean, vetch, lead plant, trefoil, and baptisia, each carrying its own bacteria housed in root nodules on its rootlets. Each nodule pumped nitrogen out of the air, into the plant, and then ultimately into the soil. Thus, the Prairie Savings Bank took its more nitrogen from its legumes than it paid out to its fires. That the prairie is rich is known to the humblest deer mouse. Why the prairie is rich is a question seldom asked in all of the still laps of ages. Between each of the excursions through the biota, X lay in the soil and was carried by the rains, inch by inch downhill. Living plants retarded the wash by impounding atoms, dead ones, by locking them in their decayed tissues. Animals ate the plants and carried them briefly uphill or downhill, depending on whether they died or defecated higher or lower than they fed. No animal uh, was aware that the altitude of his death was more important than his manner of dying. Thus a fox caught a gopher in a meadow carrying X uphill to his bed on the brow of a ridge where an eagle laid him low. The dying fox sensed the end of his chapter in foxdom, but not the new beginning in the odyssey of an atom. An Indian eventually inherited the eagle's plumes and with them uh, appropriated the fates, whom he assumed had a special interest in, in Indians. It did not occur to him that they might be busy casting dice against gravity, that mice and men, soils and song, might be merely ways to retard the march of atoms to the sea. One year, while X lay in its cottonwood by the river, he was eaten by a beaver, an animal which always feeds higher than he dies. The beaver starved when the pond dried up during the bitter frost. X rode the carcass down the spring freshet, losing more altitude each hour than heretofore in a century. He ended up in a hill in, in silt of a backwater bayou where he fed a crayfish, a coon, and then an Indian, who laid him down to his last sleep in a mound on a riverbank. One spring an oxbow 
cart caved the bank, and after one short week of freshet, X lay again in the ancient prison, the sea. An atom at large in the biota is too free to know freedom. An atom back in the sea has forgotten it. For every atom lost to the sea, the prairie pulls another out of its decaying rocks. The only certain truth is that its creatures must suck hard, live fast, and die often, loss, uh, lest its losses exceed its gains. It is the nature of roots to nose into cracks. When Y was thus released from the parent ledge, a new animal had arrived and begun reddening up the prairie to fit his own notions of law and order. An ox team turned the prairie sod and Y began a succession of dizzying animal, annual trips through a new grass called wheat. The old prairie lived by the diversity of its plants and animals, all of which were useful because of the sum uh, the sum total of their cooperations and com competitions achieved com continuity. But the wheat farmer was a builder of categories. To him, only wheat and oxen were useful. He saw the useless pigeons settle in clouds upon his wheat and shortly cleared the skies of them. He saw the cinch bugs take over the take over the stealing job and fumed because there was a useless thing too, too small to kill. He failed to see the downward wash of over weeded loam laid bare in spring against the pelting rains. When soil wash and cinch bugs finally put it into wheat farming, Y and his, uh, uh, and his like had already traveled far down the watershed. When the empire of wheat collapsed, the settler took a leaf from the old prairie book. He impounded his fertility and livestock. He augmented with nitrogen pumping alfalfa and he tapped the lower layers of the loam with deep rooted corn. With these he built the empire of red barns. But he used his alfalfa and every other new weapon against Wash not only to hold his old plowings but also to exploit new ones which in turn needed holding. So despite alfalfa, the black loam grew gradually thinner. Erosion engineers built dams and terraces to hold it. Army engineers built levees and wing dams to flush it down the rivers. The rivers would not flush, but raise their beds instead, thus choking navigation. So the engineers built pools like gigantic beaver ponds, and Y landed in one of these. His trip from rock to river completed in one short century. On the first reaching the pool, Y made several trips through water plants, fish, and waterfowl. But engineers build sewers as well as dams, and down and down them comes the root of all the far hills and the sea. The atoms which once grew past flowers to greet the returning plovers now lay inert, confused, imprisoned in oily sludge. Roots still nose through the rocks, rains still pelt the fields, deer mice still hide their souvenirs of Indian summer. Old men who helped destroy the pigeons still recount the glory of the fluttering hosts. Black and white buffalo pass in and out of red barns, offering free rides to itinerant atoms. I know it's kind of long, but he took in the naturalness of the, the prairies, the, the plants, the animals, the fungi, the soil. And then, boom, here comes man. And again, the, the, the ethics of not taking care of that soil and using it and using it and using it and having it wash away. So again, that's just, it's just a really poetic type of writing. You know, Nancy, that is um, what I was thinking while you were reading that because it's obvious the uh, <clears throat> man was a scientist, but his, his, love of language and how he used it to describe each little uh, bug and, and animal and all of the things that were uh, interconnected. I mean, how he talked about the changing color of the blue stem and, and, and the change, you just saw the changes of the seasons. It was beautiful. It really is beautiful. I can see. 
Yeah, I'm glad you said that, Gloria, because that's what struck me, too. Um, the one line he says, embark on a trip through the bloodstream of the land. I mean, he could have just said the land. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's just like, it's a living thing. It's it just, and so this is what, again, just really gets me going with, with how his, his philosophy is. Again, scientist, philosopher, writer, uh, naturalist, um, just trying to tie all things together. You know, um, this kind of brings me back to Joy uh, Kaiser's book and the Jones family and how um, Genevieve's father was a medical doctor but uh, had a long history of loving uh, the natural world and studying birds and, and flora and fauna. Um, so it was just ingrained in his children as well, which to me kind of shows that that in the 1900s, in that century, and in, in the 19th century, people were more Renaissance kind of people. They were, um, it's not polygamist, but they're, <laughs> I can't think of the name, but they polygots that Tim would be proud of me that I got that out of there but they knew a lot about a lot of different things and it's just I you know what we you reading that chapter is just I want to I'm gonna check this out of the library it's, I really want to check it out I really want to see it for myself and read it for myself so I want to thank you so much for uh, Nancy for sharing that with all of us that was really great and I'm glad you felt uh, comfortable reading a chapter of the book, your favorite chapter. That's always welcome. Um, we can do that because I think if we if we keep it to three to four or five people that share each uh, week, each fourth week of the month, we should be able to really learn a lot and get a taste for uh, some really great um, books. So. Um, Trina, pick a number from one to ten. Seven. No, that's what it was. You're next. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'm in the book that it, Trina is going to share two books with us. Uh, one called Oranges by John McPhee, and the other is a book of poetry uh, named House of Light by Mary Oliver. So, without further ado, um, Trina, why don't you share your books? Okay. Well, um, after hearing about the book club and thinking, oh, yes, this will be an opportunity for me to do some reading that I've been wanting to do, and now that I'm retired, I have an opportunity, I have the time to do it. And so in thinking about, well, what should I read, I uh, looked at, the books that I have and and found I have several by John McPhee and I had thought of him in reading two of his other books way many years ago I had thought of him as as a nature writer and I had read his book coming into the country which is about Alaska and also about Alaskans and then also a book I was just startled at called Rising into the Plains, and it's uh, like the geology of the, of the Rocky Mountains, and he made it so interesting. <laughs> it was wonderful reading, so when I was looking at what else I have to read, and it's been really a long time since I read anything of his, I found this book, Oranges. And it's exactly about oranges. And if you could imagine a whole book about oranges, uh, John McPhee uh, was born in 1931. He's still alive. And um, do any of you know him? Um, he's been a writer for The New Yorker since 1965. And he won a Pulitzer Prize at, in 1999. Um, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize three other times. So this book 
And I would just like to ask everybody right now, who had orange juice for breakfast today, or have you had orange juice any time this week? I so we did. have. Okay. I can look at all those three, hands. Three of us. Three <laughs> out of the five. Well, um, the topic of orange juice is one tiny subject, and this book is written was written in 1965, and so it is dated. And I would love to know, like, what's going on with oranges and the orange industry today. But when this book was written, the hottest item on the market was orange concentrate, frozen concentrate. And it was a hit. And he started off his study of oranges going to Florida, and he could not get fresh orange juice because everybody served concentrate because they felt that this tastes better than fresh orange juice, which was unpredictable. <laughs> and so I haven't really looked. I thought, oh, I should have gone to the grocery store today to see if orange concentrate, frozen concentrate, still available. It, it is. is okay. It is still available, but yeah, everybody's been buying just the, the carton stuff more. Yeah, the fresh squeezed. Or so just very briefly, then I'll just say his book is about oranges, about the botany of oranges, about the history of oranges, about the hist the linguistics of the word orange, about orange, he calls them orange men, those men who work in the orange groves, and also about those who uh, produce oranges and do the business aspect of it. Um, and then uh, he talks a lot about the business and the economics of oranges. And um, I think we all may know that California and Florida supply us with oranges. And um, did you know that the oranges, uh, the scientific name for orange is Citrus sinensis? which means from China, and that's where oranges most likely originated. Ooh. And uh, they made their way from China down through Malay and the um, Indonesia area over to India, and then over up into uh, the Red Sea, into Africa, and then into uh, Western Asia, and then into the Mediterranean, and then in Spain is where oranges just did phenomenally, and that's where the Valencia orange um, came from, although Valencia now does many other kinds of oranges and very few Valencias. So, And then so we have navel and Valencia oranges here in the United States, and fortunately they're on different cycles, so we can have oranges a, a you know, throughout the year. So um, I, I recommend it because it's a very creative nonfiction, too. And so it's very interesting reading. Um, and he gets into everything. You know, it's, it's not just nature. Um, it's uh, the big gestalt of oranges. And then um, the other book that I chose, which is the one I was originally going to talk about, and then I thought, oh, I ought to read something else. But Mary Oliver has been a favorite poet of mine. Um, do any of you know Mary Oliver? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so when I retired and my friends asked me, what are you going to do? I said, the first thing I'm going to do when I retire is get a cup of coffee and read poetry. And so I've been able to read poetry almost every day. And I'm, it's, I'm hoping it's going to become a habit. So I chose one poem from um, her book, House of Light. And, and um, interestingly, really, I've tried to, maybe not interestingly, but I've tried to look at each poem in this book and what it says about light. And there's usually something either overt or subtle, about light in her poems. Uh, this poem is called The Pond. Every year the lilies are so perfect, I can hardly believe 
their lap light crowding the black midsummer ponds. Nobody could count all of them. The muskrats swimming among the pads in the grasses can reach out their muscular arms and touch only so many. They're, they are that rife and wild. But what in this world is perfect? I bend closer and see how this one is clearly lopsided, and that one wears an orange blight, and this one is a glossy cheek half nibbled away, and that one is a slump purse full of its own unstoppable decay. Still, what I want in my life is to be willing to be dazzled, to cast aside the weight of facts and maybe even to float a little above this difficult world. I want to believe I am looking into the white fire of a great mystery. I want to believe that the imperfections are nothing, that the light is everything, that it is more than the sum of each flawed blossom rising and fading. And I do. And um, I've read a lot of these poems before over the years, but now I have a chance to think about them differently. And I have time, which is wonderful, to just contemplate and take in how much she is in awe of nature and how she's just so astonished with what she finds in nature. Thank you, Trina. That is that you were right. She, you can tell by the way she described the lily pads, um, she is in awe of nature and that she found all the, you know, one that was in decay, one that was just starting to emerge and, and all of that. And it's all in that one poem. That's one thing I like about poetry. It's, Hmm. Prose can be beautiful, like what Nancy shared with us, that uh, the Odyssey, um, the bloodstream, that the bloodstream of the river, going to the river. But, um, <clears throat> and that has, you get an image, but poetry, it's just, it speaks to your inner self. You know, it, it has a way of like that, you just, are immersed by a poem and and the the images that they evoke that they evoke you know are evoked and um, just I was remembering you're reading this and I'm thinking of going fishing with my father when I was a kid and uh, he always would go to where the lily pads were because the fish would if it were hot you know they would go where it was cooler and they did keep that part of the lake cooler. I hated it because my hook always got hooked <laughs> in the lily pads. But uh, it, it reminded me of that. I mean, it was the same thing. I could just, I thought, she, she must have sat where I sat, <laughs> is what I thought. Thank you so much. And you know, I'm really great. You're I'm really glad you're retired and that you thought the book discussion would be a way that you could share the books you're reading and you are always welcome, you know, to come to the author interviews and to come for this book discussion because this, you you get it. You know exactly why we're doing this. So uh, thank you okay. so much for that. Thank you, you're Marina. Welcome. That was great. I'm going to have to pick up that book on orange or oranges or because that it just sounds to me just sounds fascinating um, and you said the, the book about orange um, was published when like 1966 okay because you know if, if anybody picks up their carton of orange juice now please notice that a lot of the orange juice comes from Brazil Oh. Uh, and South America, South or Central America, Mexico. Um, I fear that we will be getting some Chinese <laughs> orange juice in the future. Yeah. Although that's where, remember, like you said, oranges yeah. uh, started in China and then were traveled around the world. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm picky when I come to my orange juice. I, I want 
uh, Florida or California. Well, um, he goes into so much about the history of how oranges come, had come into the United States, and actually our naval oranges that started in California were from Brazil. Fascinating. Thank you. That's really interesting. Well, Michelle, it's your turn. And let's see, the book that you are sharing is the, uh, I know I wrote it down here. The Death and Life of the Great Life Lakes by Dan Egan. Great Lakes by Dan, Dan Egan. Oh, wait, yeah. show that to us. Yeah. Show that book again. Let me, let me see. I'm trying to get in front of the... Yeah. Am okay. I far enough over? It, that's a big book. <laughs> How many pages is that? Um, no, I didn't. I, I, I read this um, last year, so I wasn't trying to cram it in before this discussion. It is, I'm in the notes here, 300-something. Um, oh, okay. Thank 321 you. pages. It's not too bad. Um, and what I really like about this book, I, it, it says on your um, screen there, show your favorite nature book. I don't know if I have a favorite one, but this is a really, really good one. Um, it is a very, it includes a very extensive history of the Great Lakes. It's jam-packed full of information, uh, but the author really just tells a wonderful story with it. Uh, well, not wonderful. There's a lot of bad news <laughs> uh, when it comes to what we've done with the Great Lakes. Unfortunately, a, a lot of um, non-native invasive species have been introduced due to our meddling uh, with the Great Lakes. Um, just bringing in you know, freighters from it, the Atlantic Ocean and then the ballast water that that's released into the Great Lakes has really um, just brought in some really nasty creatures that have upset the ecological balance in the Great Lakes and uh, have decimated some of our native species, our native fish. Um, but the author does, fortunately for my sanity, sprinkle in a little bit of hope as well. Um, there are actions being taken to try and uh, help the Great Lakes. Um, and it's just it's a it's a really good read. He tells a really good story. Now Dan Egan is not a scientist; um, he is a, a journalist, and he has just poured through every historical document that must exist pertaining to the Great Lakes. And he has done countless interviews with anyone who has ever worked with the Great Lakes in any capacity. Um, people charged with restocking fish with the Great Lakes, to the people that are working to conserve the Great Lakes. Um, so yeah, he does a fantastic job uh, with painting the entire picture. And where he begins with a history um, is at, at the point of history where the Great Lakes are being discovered by um, Westerners. So not he doesn't go back too much farther than that. Um, but anyways, I did choose a, couple of paragraphs to read. Um, it is the intro introduction paragraphs to chapter four called Noxious Cargo, the Invasion of Zebra and Quagga Mussels. Um, so here we go. The first day of June 1988 was sunny, hot, and mostly calm. Perfect weather for the three young researchers from the University of Windsor who were hunting for critters crawling across the bottom of Lake St. Clair. Sonia Santavi was a freshly graduated biologist aboard a 16-foot-long runabout as the whining outboard pushed the boat toward the middle of the lake that straddles the U.S. and Canadian border. On a map, Lake St. Clair looks like a 24-mile aneurysm in the river system east of Detroit that connects Lake Huron to Lake Erie, and that is essentially what it is. Water pools in it and then churns through as the outflows from Lake Superior, Michigan, and Huron tumble down into Erie then continue flowing east over Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario and finally down the St. Lawrence Seaway and out to the Atlantic Ocean. The current pulsing through Lake St. Clair is so strong that if you were to hop an inflatable raft at the top of the lake, you'd flush out the other side in about two days without having a paddle a stroke. 
Water rushes so quickly through Lake St. Clair because it is as shallow as a swimming pool in most places, except for an approximately 30-foot deep navigation channel down its middle. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers carved that pathway in the early 1960s as part of the Seaway project to allow ocean-going freighters to sail between Lake Erie and the lake upstream from it. When water levels were low or sediment high, sometimes the channel still wasn't deep enough, forcing ships to lighten their loads to squeeze through. This often meant dumping water from the ships, setting ballast tanks. Water taken aboard outside the Great Lakes. Water that could be swarming with exotic life picked up at ports across the planet. As Santa V and her University of Windsor colleagues puttered over a rock bottom portion of Lake St. Clair in the early summer of 1988, she whimsically dropped her sampling scoop into the cobble below. She was hunting for muck loving worms, but figured she'd take a poke into the rocks below because, well, to this day she still doesn't know. And here's her quote I can't even explain why it popped into my head, Santa V told me. I thought if we get nothing, we get nothing, and I'll just mark it off that this is not an area to sample. Up came a wormless scoop of stones, the smallest of which were not bigger than her fingertips. But there was something odd about two of these tinier pebbles. They were stuck together. She tried to pull them apart, but she couldn't. Then she realized that one of them wasn't a pebble at all. It was alive. And that is, I'll leave it there. Um, obviously, it was one of those horrible mussels that has made its way into the Great Lakes. Um, but yeah. That's, I guess, all I have to share about this book, just that I um, really found it fascinating and just a complete picture of the state of the Great Lakes today. It was published in 2017, so it is fairly recent mm -hmm. as well. Thank you, Michelle. And you left us with that cliffhanger. Yeah. Great. You know, <laughs> read the two paragraphs and then leave the cliffhanger. So what happened next? <laughs> That's great. That's really good. I, you know, it, I guess I have my reading cut out for me in the last uh, few, <laughs> the next few months. This is great. We're going to add these books to our uh, book list that we have on uh, the WCAS um <clears throat> website and each of you will be given the credit for sharing the book with us and that that is why it is now one of our two for Drina and then the others are uh, on our list of uh, <clears throat> other things. Well, I am so glad that you're all here because I was afraid it might be Nancy and me. So <laughs> it's not. And I'm really glad. And we've got about 10 minutes left. So I think that'll give me a little bit of time. And then we can do a wrap up. Uh, and thank you all for coming. I will probably thank you again. When I was thinking of that, I thought I better find a book that I can, can uh, share in case we didn't have enough people. So I love the book Walden, um, A Year in the Woods, uh, by Henry David Thoreau. And so I went on Amazon and I thought I was getting the actual Henry David Thoreau was the author of this book. And he is, but it's more or less quotes and it is illustrated beautifully by Giovanni Mana. And um, I don't know how well you can see this, but I'm going to try to share it with you. Uh, this is the preface of his book, and I think that I'm going to read that one, and then there's one little other thing about forests that he says that I wanted to say. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life to live so sturdily and Spartan-like 
as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. And it proved to be mean. Why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it <clears throat> and publish it, its meanness to the world, or if it were sublime, to know it by experience and be able to give a true account of it in my next excursion. So that is why he went to spend his time in the woods. And then he talked about Walden and the fact, and you can see he's on the pond, and it, that looks like a very young uh, Henry David Thoreau, so I'm thinking this is a children's book that they are trying to get children interested in the natural world. And it's a beautiful, beautifully illustrated book. This uh, quote is, Walden is a perfect forest mirror set round with stones as precious to my eye as if fewer or rarer. Nothing so fair, so pure, and at the same time so large as the lake, perchance, lies on the surface of the earth. Sky water, it needs no fence. So that was that. And, you know, I've read this a couple of times. My daughter, Kate, read it. And she says, oh, she goes, did you buy this for the, one of the girls for Christmas? And I thought to myself, nope, not giving it up. <laughs> I may buy them another, but that was it. You know, it really comes to mind here, all of us, uh, with Nancy sharing our first book, where she was talking about Aldo Leopold, being the father of ecology and how everything is interconnected on the planet, above the planet, in the planet. It's, we're all connected. And it was really interesting. I was thinking when she was reading about that, about the uh, Easterners coming west to the prairie and damming the rivers and building huge ponds, you know, pools of water for water and things, that now the Cuyahoga River, they're taking out the dams that they, because they realize that for so long, I mean, for the Cuyahoga River up by us in Cleveland here was considered dead for many, many years. And so they realize now that channeling that water and, and not letting it flow naturally is a detriment to ecology. Um, <clears throat> Drina brought up the fact that, what, they decided that orange concentrate was better putting, you know, this little can of something in and having three cans of water added to it is better than the real thing. That just, to me, is so, uh, <laughs> it's mind-boggling that somebody would think that something fake or part natural would be better than fresh squeezed orange juice. So that that was it. And then, of course, uh, Michelle brought up the same thing, that what has happened to our Great Lakes um, is uh, kind of devastating. I mean, we've lost species of fish that my father used to uh, fish for in the lake, and they're, they're not there anymore. They can't find them. So uh, it's very odd times we live in, especially when water is now going to be sold on the commodities uh, exchange on Wall Street. Um, that, to me, is very troubling and should be to all of us. But anyway, it was really, I love that we all had a little bit of hope in there and uh, we did share a lot of things. And I just want to welcome you all back, and thank you for coming. And um, our next author, and 
Betsy, go off mute because I cannot uh, uh, retrieve Katie Fallon's book that she is going to share the name of it. I know that it is about, there it is, Vulture, the Private Life of an Unloved Bird. And I just, I've just been watching the vultures there. I, yesterday I had five, today I had ten. They are circling uh, around the zoo because I believe they're getting ready to go south uh, uh, for the winter. They they roost uh, on a ledge on the ridge above the zoo. And so when I sit in my backyard, I see them circle, circling all the time and uh, never over my house. <laughs> but they are there. So uh, that's October, Vulture, the private life of the unloved bird, and then November 15th and 22nd. Oh, and I believe that both of our authors for October and November, David Lindo is our November, and he's going to be talking about how to be an urban birder, and he is to have a book released in October, so we're hoping that he will share some of the uh, tidbits from his new book that will be coming out just the month before he's with us. And they both have uh, expressed an interest to come to our discussion. So um, Joy was hoping she could make it because when I said we were going to share our favorite nature book, she goes, oh, I wish I could come. <laughs> but she was, uh, she was busy this week. So again, can't thank you enough for all of you coming. And I hope you enjoyed it. And yes. look thank you. This. Uh, on um, our website because Betsy will be putting up the recording and you can tell your friends and family, hey, go see what I shared at the book discussion and maybe you'll get some of them interested too. So talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That was Wonderful. great. It was very nice.